Saul disobeys God. In our last story, we learned about Jonathan's bravery against the Philistines. Jonathan broke up the enemy's camp and sent them into a frenzy. Saul capitalized on Jonathan's bravery and sent his army in to defeat the Philistines. In this story, we will learn about Saul's disobedience towards God because of his desire to please the people instead of God, inspired by the book of 1 Samuel. Hello, this is Jack Graham with today's episode of the Bible in a Year podcast. In our previous story, we focused on Jonathan's actions, which stood in stark contrast to his father, King Saul. When Saul tried to have Jonathan killed for disobeying a senseless order, the people rallied around Jonathan and protected him. Saul was by now king only in title. He was no longer the strong leader that he wanted to be and God commanded him to be. His selfish pride and impatience had cost him nearly everything. Today, we'll see Saul disobey God in a desperate attempt to be a people pleaser rather than a godly leader. We will see how Saul's need to be liked, accepted, and praised by the people will lead him to lie and deceive. But Samuel, speaking for God, will see right through it all and give Saul a devastating word from the Lord. Let's listen to today's scripture. Saul led Israel with a strong arm. Battle after battle, the armies of Israel defended themselves against enemy kingdoms. Nations that had once oppressed Israel now feared them. And Saul began to regain favor from the people. One day, a word of the Lord came to Samuel. Samuel entered into the courts of Saul. This was the first time they had spoken since Saul unrightfully acted as priest over Israel before battle. Samuel could barely look at Saul any more. His demeanor had slowly changed from humble servant to arrogant king. Nevertheless, Samuel had a message from God to share. Saul, God has remembered the Amalekites and their crimes against them and made life hard. Now it is your duty to rise up against them. However, you must leave none of them alive, none, no soldier, warrior, woman, animal, or riches. Saul wasted no time, for the Amalekites were truly wicked people. Their evil had corrupted the land surrounding them, and their oppression knew no bounds. Saul was grateful for a chance to prove himself to God and to Samuel. His sword was heavy against the armies of the Amalekites. The armies of Israel prevailed swiftly and laid waste to the city. All that remained was their king, Agag, and the riches of their livestock. Saul considered killing Agag and burning his riches. Instead, Saul spared Agag to parade him in front of the people, and he took all the livestock, riches, and wealth of the city for himself. Saul brought the spoils of war back to himself and the people of Israel, and he sat on the wealth of a corrupt nation. As he returned to Israel, Saul made a monument for himself, a clear representation of his delusion of self-importance. Samuel was dwelling alone in the cool of his home when the Lord came to him and spoke, saying, Saul has turned his back from me, and I regret ever making him king. Samuel cried to the Lord all night in anger, for Saul had been exactly what he warned the people of. Early the next day, Samuel approached the throne room of Saul. Saul was elated to see Samuel, ignorant of his anger towards him. Blessed are you, Samuel. Look, I have done as God commanded. The Amalekites are wiped away. What are these sounds I hear of sheep and oxen? Samuel interrupted. Samuel was old and frail, yet he spoke with a strength that demanded attention. They are from the Amalekites. The people, they wanted me to spare them to make sacrifices unto God. In fact, I... Shh. Samuel interrupted again with his hand in the air. Stop! he yelled. Samuel knew Saul was lying. He had no intention of sacrificing anything to the Lord. You were appointed king by God, and you were given a mission to consume the Amalekites. You were instructed to spare nothing and take nothing. So tell me, Saul, why did you not obey? Why did you pounce on the spoils and riches? Saul smiled in fake ignorance. 
he laughed as though he did not see anything wrong with his actions. Standing up from his throne, Saul stepped down and put his hand on Samuel's shoulder and said, Samuel, I have simply obeyed the voice of God. It is the people that wanted the spoils of war, not me. Yet I took the best of everything to sacrifice to God. Samuel brushed the king's hands off his shoulder. Saul was over two feet taller than Samuel, yet Samuel in this moment seemed to loom over him like a nightmare. Has God any delight in vain sacrifices when you have ignored his voice? Behold, Saul, it is far better to obey than to sacrifice. Rebellion is like witchcraft to him, and to presume you know better than him is worse than idolatry. Saul's eyes began to widen as he listened to Samuel. Samuel rose his arm and pointed to Saul. Because you have rejected God as your Lord, he has rejected you as king. As Samuel said this, he turned and stormed off. Saul chased after Samuel. No, Samuel, no, I have sinned. I feared the people would turn against me. Saul begged him to stay. Please pardon my sin. Stay here and help me atone. Saul's fear of losing his throne caused a panic. He seized Samuel's robes and tugged back for him to stay. Samuel's robes began to tear. The sound of the tears echoed in the empty throne room. Samuel and Saul stood there looking at the torn garment. They were alone and completely silent for a few moments. Tears streamed down Saul's face. Samuel looked at the pathetic king in front of him. Though he cried, Samuel could see corruption in his heart. There was something disturbing dwelling inside him. Just as you have torn my robe, so God has torn Israel away from you and given it to another. Saul wept on the floor. Samuel looked at him with compassion. He led Saul to the altar of God to pray. God would not change his mind, but he would not abandon Saul completely. After they had prayed, Samuel had Saul bring King Agag before him. Agag approached them with a smile on his face. Agag was under the impression that Saul would not harm him, but he had not yet met Samuel. Agag looked at the old man and laughed. He mocked him. Samuel looked at Agag and said, You have led with corruption, greed, and wickedness. Your sword has made women childless. So shall your mother become childless. And in that instant, Samuel hacked off the head of Agag before Saul. Samuel wiped off the blade, handed it to Saul, and left. Saul would not see Samuel again, for death would soon take Samuel back to the Lord. Yet Samuel grieved over Saul. He grieved his heart and his mind. Yet Samuel would get to see another king anointed, a king with flaws, weaknesses, and failures. Yet he was a king that would pursue the heart of God, someone Israel could look on to as an example of bravery, repentance, and worship. A shepherd like Moses, a warrior like Joshua, and a priest like Samuel. Today's story begins with Samuel receiving a word from God to give to King Saul. That word was this, God had not forgotten the cruelty of the Amalekites from the time Israel departed Egypt, and now it was time for them to account for their evil. So Samuel went to Saul and gave him orders. Saul was to fight against the Amalekites, and after God granted him victory, Saul was to completely wipe them out. Not a single person or even the livestock of the Amalekites was to be spared. Saul is given an opportunity to obey God and to do his will completely. Israel defeated the enemy, and Saul's army carried out the mission, for the most part. Saul kept the enemy king, Agag, alive. All the remaining Amalekites were killed, and everything considered worthless was destroyed. But they spared the best of the livestock, taking it as plunder. Saul was looking on as all of this happened. Rather than completely obeying God's command, Saul wanted to please the people and increase his name and his power among them. But God sees through this, of course, and Saul's disobedience greatly displeases him, so he spoke again to Samuel. God rejects Saul as king. Samuel was distraught. Saul, who once held so much potential, had fallen so far, and Samuel knew that God would not allow this to stand. 
Samuel returned to Saul and on the way discovered that Saul had built a monument to himself after the victory. It was worse than he had even imagined. Not only was Saul disobeying God, now he was exalting himself, seeking glory that belonged only to the Lord. Samuel confronted Saul, who once again made excuses and tried to justify himself. First, he tried to couch his actions as obedience. He said he had brought King Agag back as if this was some kind of prize that he would give to God, and that the people set aside the best livestock to offer as sacrifices to the Lord. All of this was a lie. God never told Saul to spare Agag, and he certainly didn't ask for offerings. God's orders had been very clear. All was to be destroyed, sparing nothing. This is another sad story of Saul's disobedience. And it reminds us that God does not accept disobedience or partial obedience. Partial obedience is disobedience. Samuel then tells Saul the bad news. Because he has rejected God, God has rejected him as king. The throne will be taken from him and given to another. Saul is desperate and tries once more to justify his sin. In 1 Samuel 15, 24, he says, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. This reminds us of the words of Adam blaming Eve for his sin in the Garden of Eden. Saul shifts blame to the people, and he says he was just trying to please them. He's making excuses, but it's too late. God has seen Saul's sin and his pride, and the Bible says pride comes before a fall. There's no turning back now. Saul holds on to Samuel's robe and tears it, and then Samuel tells him that just as he's torn his garment, God will tear the kingdom away from Saul. Samuel then does what Saul did not. He kills King Agag right in front of Saul. He leaves, mourning Saul's disobedience, and never sees the king again until his death. God would bring another king, one who did have his heart and, though not perfect, would lead God's people as God intended and planned, and we'll meet him the next time. Dear God, may we always obey you completely, not half-heartedly, but completely. Help us to fear you more than man and to listen to you rather than to listen to the world. May we have the boldness to do what you have called us to do regardless of the cost, because we know that the cost of rejecting you is greater than we can possibly imagine. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you for listening to today's Bible in a Year podcast. I'm Pastor Jack Graham from Dallas, Texas. Download the Pray.com app and make Bible study and prayer a priority in your life. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share it with someone you know because it can make a genuine, even eternal difference in their lives. And if you want more resources on how you can know the power of God through Jesus Christ, then visit jackgraham.org. This episode is sponsored by MediShare, an innovative healthcare solution for Christians to save money without sacrificing quality.